Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> got your outline in front of you. I've got um, cut down to just two pages. And uh, first, uh, just thanking the Lord for the message. <clears throat> he definitely richly blessed again, as he always does, and just thank him for the message uh, from his hand. It's not me, it's the Lord for sure. Um, the message title this morning is the Name of the Lord Jesus <clears throat> by the Spirit of our God. And what I want to preach by God's grace is that you have the name of Christ. You, you're a believer here this morning. His name is his character and conduct. And that character and conduct of the precious Lord Christ is in you. It's charged to you directly if you know him savingly and i just i just want to preach um, glory to christ on the back of the outline are the main points that are just i pray god minister to you he washed you're you're washed in christ's own blood you're <coughs> sanctified by the sprinkling of the blood of jesus and ye are justified by his blood it's by, it's the blood of christ that saves you and I just want you to know that the name of the Lord is is your name. It's your name now. You're you're considered clean based on the blood of Christ, and you you're a joint heir with God Almighty. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. You grasp who He is. You believe on Him, and you are saved by His blood and righteousness. So that's the message in a nutshell. Um, but the outline includes some fair warnings, some aggressive warnings. Um, there's a sin unto death. I want to explain what that is. And there's a sin that grieves the Holy Spirit within you. And I want you to be knowledgeable of that grief that we're in this flesh still, and we go through many trials and temptations, and you need to be knowledgeable of this sin that so easily besets us and know how to combat it. Look back to Christ, of course. But um, by way of introduction, I've got three points I want to nail down so to edify you in the Word. The first one is godly jealousy. I'm jealous for each one here. I am just adamantly jealous. God's Word says in Zechariah 8.2 that God says that He was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I believe this is the time period of after the fall of Adam, when you fell in Adam. And before he puts his Holy Spirit in you through the preach message, he's jealous during that time. You're out worshiping other gods. You're out whoring around. You're out thinking that you can save yourself. You're out ignoring the Lord Jesus Christ. He's jealous. He's, he's a jealous God. 2 Corinthians 11.2 is in your outline. And this is Paul preaching to people that he was jealous over. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is saying, I've preached Christ's righteousness, his blood and righteousness alone and salvation. Trust in it. Rest in it. Rely in it. It's the only thing reliable for salvation is Christ's blood. And I'm jealous. If you trust any other means, I'm jealous. I don't want you to. I want you to come to know God savingly. I want you to be a joint heir with Christ, a, a brother, a son of God. I want you to be there. I want you to be saved. The second point in that introduction is the Holy Ghost within joins you with Christ. This is a common ground. You've got common ground with Christ if you're saved here this morning. Common ground with Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus the cursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but the Holy Ghost within you. You cannot even acknowledge the true Christ exists, lest the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And of course, when he puts the Holy Spirit within you, you see that you're the dead dog sinner. That you're the problem, you're the offense. That you fell in Adam and that you hated God your whole life. You despised him so much, you devised a means of salvation that excluded Christ. Or maybe partly included him, which is completely excluding him. 
and that Holy Spirit convince you that you're you're a dead dog sinner, but also that you're washed with the blood of Christ and you're free. You're free from the sin of Adam based on Christ's work alone, not anything that you've ever done. The Holy Spirit can only give credit to salvation to Christ. That's the only thing. That's the third point in the opening, opening of this message. And I want to go to Luke and show you this. Turn to Luke chapter 1, please. Luke chapter 1 and verse... 59 through 79 and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child this is John the Baptist and they called Zacharias John's father after the name they called him Zacharias they wanted to name him Zacharias and his mother answered and said not so he shall be called John well they were visited by an angel and told that they were going to bear a son and he was going to be the last prophet and he, there, he was going to proclaim that the true lights come into the world and look to Christ alone. And that's what Zacharias and, and uh, the mother of John were told. So they were following along with what God's word says, saying, name him John. We're not going to name him after his dad. We're going to name him John. That's what God told us to name him. And they said unto her, there is none of thy kindred that called by this name. They thought that was a crazy. And they made signs to the father and that who uh, couldn't speak at that time. Zacharias doubted God. Angel stood right in front of him and said, this is what's going to happen. Zachariah said, we're too old to have a child. Couldn't speak. And the angel told him, you're not even going to be able to speak until this is fulfilled. You don't believe this? This is the truth. And you're not going to have your tongue to use for a few months here. But once John's born, I'll loose it. And that's what was going on in verse 63. And they asked for a writing table. John the Baptist's father said, I need a writing table. And he wrote saying, his name is John. And they marveled. So his name was John. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosened, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt around about them. And all those sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them, them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child is this to be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, as was filled with the Holy Ghost, prophesied, saying, Blessed, now this is what I want to get to. This is the Holy Ghost. This is the message from the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. The Holy Ghost only brags on salvation on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the single source of salvation. The Holy Spirit says it directly out of, out of this man's mouth after being loosened for nine some months. Finally, the Holy Spirit says, visited and redeemed his people. God in the flesh is going to come down and save his people from their sins. He raised up a horn and salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our fathers Abram. And he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. There's no more bondage or fear when you're saved by Christ's blood. There's no more bondage. You don't need to worry about doing anything anymore. It's all been done for you. 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, and now Zacchaeus is speaking right to John the Baptist. Speaking to his newborn baby, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. You're going to tell that this is the true light, that this Jesus is the one to look forward to, to for salvation. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light. To them that sit in darkness in Christ is the light. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The way of peace is Christ's righteousness alone. And this is the Holy Spirit speaking out of Zacchaeus. Zacharias, John the Baptist's father. So we see the third point of the introduction. That the Holy Spirit brags on and gives all credit and honor and glory and salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And now moving to the point one of the message, there is a sin unto death, however. 
it's walking away from the gospel. Turn to 1 John with me. I wanted everybody here to be knowledgeable about what this is. I came across this, and I just really wanted to give the knowledge of what it is to you. 1 John chapter 5. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 15, And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, however. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches them not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and the eternal life and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. There's a couple of points I want to bring out of this. First of all, in verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 18, we're born of God. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You cannot sin if you're born of God. Once God puts his Holy Spirit in you through a godly messenger, you cannot go back to trusting your righteousness, your self works unto salvation. You can't do it. You agree with Christ as the alone salvation. You're alone stay. And verse 18 also says, But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, that the wicked one touches him not. Satan doesn't have any dominion over you anymore. And it's the Holy Spirit that's inside you that keepeth yourself. It's the Holy Spirit that says for sure in every case, God alone gets the credit for salvation. There's no way I'll walk away. There's no way I can stop believing on Christ. He is my only confidence. Verse 20. Oh, wait. Verse 19. The whole world lieth in wickedness. Believers know that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Because everything that the world says says look to something else. And we have a distinguishing separation in our mindset to know the Holy Spirit says that's not right. That's wickedness. And we can see the difference between wickedness, self-righteousness, and holiness, Christ's righteousness. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given, check this out, knowledge and understanding that we may know him. That's the Holy Spirit within each one of his people. Understanding to grasp who we are, grasp who Christ is, and to know that there's the true Christ, the one that died for a particular people, that's the one that we rest on. Once God puts his Holy Spirit within us. And we're in him and he in us. We're joint heirs with God, the Father, in Christ Jesus. Never to be separated again. We're completely free. But back in this chapter, or in this verse, 16. Ver the middle part of the verse, there is a sin unto death. There's a sin unto death that believers will never know. That's called walking away. We cannot walk away. But be warned, there is a sin unto death. Turn to Hebrews 6 with me. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away to renew them again under re repentance, seeing they have crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. There's no way that a believer that grasps who they are and who Christ is will ever walk away. They will never blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. That's in Luke 12, 10 in your outline. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. This is the sin that won't, that's unto death, that will never be forgiven. You say that the Holy Spirit's in you, and that you grasp that you're a sinner, that Christ is your Savior, then you leave this church, it's a declaration that you'll perish eternally. There's no hope for you. 
he will never take pleasure in your soul again. It's, it's over. It's, it's not a work that you do to lose salvation. It's a declaration you never were a believer. And everybody here needs to be sober to this and realize it's a real fact. The second sin that I want to go over is the sin that grieves the spirit within you. And this is a moral issue. Let's, let's look at what King David went through in his situation. Second Samuel, please. Turn to Second Samuel. King David went through quite a, an event in his life with immorality and grieved the spirit. And, and we go through the same things. And I'm not picking on this one immoral act as saying this is the one. It's, it's all of them. Anything that's not based on God's word, that's good and right in God's word, it's wrong. It's immoral. We all flee from it. King David saw Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and he desired her, had sex with her, and tried to cover it up after she got pregnant. Right? You remember the story, just in brief, before I read some details. Um, Uriah was was Bathsheba's husband and King David in the authority and position he was ruler of the land he had the ability to bring Uriah back out of war said bring that soldier back to be with his wife so I can cover up the fact I got her pregnant uh, Uriah was so true to his fellow soldiers he refused to go into his house and lay with his wife and have a joyful evening he, he slept on the front doorstep that night so David was still in a tough situation that woman's pregnant. I got her pregnant. I got to cover my guilt. I'm going to have Uriah killed. So he told um, his captain that when Uriah is in the battle, pull the other men back in the heat of the battle. Make sure he dies. And it, it, it worked. Uriah is dead at this point. Verse 9 of Second Psalm chapter 12. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Now this is Nathan correcting David. And Nathan was going through quite a situation in his own right, correcting the king of the land. And knowing that he could kill him, didn't like what he was going to do, he just left his head off his shoulders. But he went in bold, just like I'm encouraging each one here today. Go in bold. Verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, Here's grace. The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. There is unearned favor that Nathan the messenger, the corrector, says, God's not going to kill you. <laughs> Christ is going to take this very sin. It grieves the Spirit. He's going to take this sin away from you and take it on himself. It's unearned favor. This is grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon David. Look in verse 14. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Nathan reminding King David, as a believer, when you're immoral, when you do things outside of God's holy word, if it's not in God's holy word and you're actively out there pursuing and doing it, making friends with people that hate God, doing things that are ungodly, unseemly, that's a disgrace. And it's no different than having an affair with a woman and killing her husband to cover it up. It's all a disgrace. If it's outside of God's word and Christ's character and conduct, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Turn to Ephesians 4. It's not a sin unto death. It's not a sin unto death. However, believers ought to be grieved because it's against Christ. Any sin is against Christ. Any and every sin is against Christ. 
David said it well. I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't say he sinned against Uriah. I sinned against the Lord. All sin is against Christ. Ephesians 4 and verse 22. Put off, put off these things, a former conversation of, an old, of your old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Now jump down to verse 30. Why should we put these things off? Because it grieves the Holy Spirit. So the message this morning... <laughs> Don't grieve the Holy Spirit within you. Put off, put on, and put away is what God's... A lot of puts here in this, these verses 22 through 30. So let's look at some of them. That ye put off concerning the former conversation of old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speaking, every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his own hands in the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I want to come back to that and make a key point. But going down these, put off, put off all those former things. You used to think that you could save yourself. You used to think that your immorality was justified. I don't have what I want, so I'm going to go out and get it and do it my way, just like David did. Put that off. Get rid of that nonsense. Be renewed in verse 23 and 24. Focus on the Holy Spirit that the Lord's given you. You're not your own anymore. He purchased you with the blood of Christ. You are not your own. You can't walk around and say, I'm going to do what I want when I want. There's no such thing as free will a man. Follow after the word of God. Be obedient to everything herein. Be mindful of everything herein. Anything else? Idolatry. Keep yourself from idols. Stay away from that stuff. Be renewed in your mind and stop your lying. Stop being deceitful. That's what the Satan did in the fall. Why are you going back to that stuff? Stay honest and true. Edify other people. Nathan edified. He went to the king to say, you're a disgrace. Your actions are disgraceful. They, they make it look like you believe in free will anymore. You look like you're not a believer anymore. And by God's grace, that was received. And King David said, you're right. I've sinned against God Almighty. This is serious. But be that one that reproves. Go back and tell the fault. John the Baptist did it. Remember John the Baptist? If you want to study that, that out, that's in Luke 3.18. John the Baptist reproved Herod about sleeping with his brother's wife. And the other thing when I was studying this that blew my mind is he also reproved King Herod about all the evil which Herod had done. And the fact that God's word has the word all in it, I believe it. I believe that John the Baptist went back to King Herod on all, every single event and said, that's evil. What, it get, what did it get, John the Baptist? His head sliced off. And if, if, it, if the correction that we deliver God haters or a dear believer gets our head sliced off, so be it. The honor and glory goes to God alone, and we ought to be about the business of edifying everybody, unbelievers and believers alike, correcting and saying that's against God's word. Verse 29 wraps it up. Very key point. Let's look at 29 again. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What's grace? You are a guilty, dead dog sinner, a God hater, and Christ died for you right then. Somebody comes up to you and it tears you up, runs you down, uses you, steals you the valuables in your life. You don't even lift a hand. You say, so be it. God told you to do that. That's grace. They use you and abuse you in this life. We're not here to stay. So what? Take my wagon. Take everything. Looking on to Christ. Minister grace to him. Return the favor of evil as good. 
they deliver evil to you, turn around and deliver good back. This is the Lord Christ's message to you. Deliver wholesome, holy grace when they deliver the scum of hate back to you. Deliver grace, everything grace. For, turn to First Thessalonians, please. <coughs> I'm hung up on this because anything short of returning grace to somebody that hates your guts is to say that they had free will to come and do that to you, and they don't. God Almighty delivered that message to you, delivered that torment, that situation, and if you don't see it from his hand, you're already looking away. Look to God in everything in your life, no matter how tormenting, no matter how awful you think it is. Look to God and say, to him be the glory. And to this person that's bringing this thing to me that's so evil and wrong, here's goodness back. This is the God I serve. He's good to me when I hated him. 1 Thessalonians 5, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now that's all men, not just believers, that's everybody. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. He's saying every single person, just like the two examples I brought you from the Word, whether they're a believer or not, you render good back to them. You give them the good holy word of the Lord. You tell them who God is. You rejoice evermore. You pray for them without ceasing. This is for your enemies. You ask God, please save them. They're tormenting me in my life. So what? Save them. They're lost like I was. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, this is a verse you can stand on for the rest of your life. You have some evil come your way in your life. In everything, give thanks. Uh, but I lost somebody that's dear to me. In everything, give thanks. I gained a promotion. In everything, give thanks. That's not you're earning it. That's God's mercy towards you. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you personally. Every moment of your day, every moment that's either tormenting or rejoiceful, eyes back on Christ, you gave this to me. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil and that's a good thing to think of coming into the wicked christian holiday supposed christian holiday in america abstain from all appearance of evil stay away from christmas it's ridiculous it's a it's a whore it's saying that christ died for everybody he did not die for every he died for particular people the very elect and the very god of peace sanctify you wholly and i pray god your whole spirit your soul your body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Now, circle, he will do it and go back to keep you, your spirit and your soul, body preserved. God Almighty keeps and preserves you in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those things that you lose in this world, people mock you, despise you, bless them, pray for them, smile back, Tell them the truth of the gospel. Tell them who Christ is. I want to show you the parable of the unmerciful servant. It will blow your mind. Move, go to Matthew 18 with me. Christ taught boldly from this parable of the unmerciful servant. And I think it shows exactly what's going on in this message this morning. There's a sin unto death. There's people that are going to act like they believe the gospel and they're going to walk away and they weren't ever believers. And there's those that are believers that are just not looking at the Holy Spirit. They're not focused that they've been, that they're bought with a price. That they're not even, we're not even ourselves. Our body isn't ours and our spirit isn't ours. Both have been brought back again in union with God. Yet we're still on this earth. Be sober to this. Be mindful of this. Peter came to Christ in verse 21. Of Matthew 18 and said Lord how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him about seven times Jesus said no no not seven 70 times seven he Christ said 
Don't ever stop forgiving them. Just keep on forgiving. I forgave you. Why are you trying to act like there's a, a number that works? I forgave you completely. Forgive everybody else completely. The kingdom of heaven, verse 23, is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That's a fortune. It, this is a big problem. He owed him a fortune. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold. This is just simple economics. You can't pay your debt, you're a slave. You're going to be sold to slavery. Your wife's going to be sold. Your children are going to be sold. And all the possessions you have, they're going to be sold because you have to reconcile this debt. It's a sure thing. It's going to happen. The servant in verse 26 fell down, worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I'll pay thee all. What's he say? The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, forgave him the debt. He didn't even say you had to pay one dollar back. It's 100% forgiven. Go on your way. You're free as a bird. What's the guy do? Same servant went out in verse 28, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, laid hands on him, took him by the throat. Pay me that which you owe me. Fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, I don't have, have patience with me. I'll pay thee all. Verse 30, he would not. Went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that was done, they were sorrowful. They were very sorry. Came and told their Lord all that was done. The Lord after that, he called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servants, even as I had pity on thee? His Lord is wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. This is serious. Delivered to the tormentors, never to be released out of torment. So this is a declaration from the Lord Christ. If you won't forgive people, you're not even forgiving yourself. This is serious. Likewise shall the heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses, if you have it in your heart to hold people accountable and have grudges and say, I'm going to press back on you and get revenge, God's not in you. The Holy Spirit's not in you. The Holy Spirit says, use me, abuse me, and I'll still pray for you. The Holy Spirit says, I've got a complete freedom now. I'm free like a bird, and I'm going to deliver the same message to everybody that uses and abuses me. I'm going to be gracious unto the people that hate me and pray for their souls. Grace is to love those who despitefully use you, dear ones. This is where we ought to be as believers in this world. Turn to James chapter 1 with me. James chapter 1 is a, is a serious warning about duplicity. Saying you believe, yet you won't forgive people. Saying you believe, but you're going to get revenge on them. You're going to pay them back. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the devil. James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. <laughs> You get all beat up by the world. You're supposed to count that joy, dear one. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience is turning all those losses into grace and glory to God, to praise God for them. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. See, everything is just provided. All the blood and righteousness of Christ is provided for you. You don't have to do anything for salvation. It's all just a free gift. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is somebody that does not rest on God's word, does not want anything to do with God's word, would rather come up with a solution on their own logical mindset. It's hate for God. It's going the wrong way. Dear one, 
don't do it. Don't follow your heart. Follow God's word. Faith in verse 6, but let him ask in faith. That's going to the word for a promise. You're in a difficult situation in your life. Hunker down in the word. Read the word until God enlighten you. Say, there it is. With his Holy Spirit within you, he's going to open up a passage and say, there it is. That's the direction of my life. I'm going to go that way. I'm going to rest and stand on this one verse to get me through this tormenting time in my life. That's asking in faith, and God delivers that over and over again in the life of his people through the Holy Spirit that he's put within you. So the word is where we go in times of torment and trials. And look at, look at uh, John 1 for what the word is. Turn to John 1 with me. John in chapter 1. Look at who the word is, rather. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Christ walked right here on this earth, and people that weren't enlightened by His Holy Spirit didn't even know who He was. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Through the light of Christ you have belief and salvation. He was not the light, not John the Baptist wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And Christ is just simply called that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And lighteth here means to identify. Christ's light shines on you and either reflects back the Holy Spirit within or there's darkness. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into the world and his own received him not. The Jews hated Christ. But as many as received him, <laughs> given power to become the sons of God, the Holy Spirit is what causes you to receive Christ. He gives you through the message, the Holy Spirit, you acknowledge you're the sinner and Christ is a Savior, and in that process, you become the Son of God. You become a joint heir with Christ himself. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of the blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God are you born again. You're given a new heart by God's will, by God's working in you, not by man's work. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Christ was here in the flesh, God came down from heaven in the form of a man born of a virgin and lived the law, fulfilling the law perfectly for every one of his people, was tortured on the cross for his people, shed his blood for his people, was resurrected for his people, ascended for his people, and intercedes right now for his people alone. And that brings us to the main point is... Christ dwelt among us, point number three in your outline. And we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians, where Rick read this morning. 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. And we're going to go right into verse 11. Now we're in the heart of the message. There's A, B, C, and D points. Verse 11, and such were some of you. You think about all these things that are despicable that God brings up here in verse 9 and 10. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers. All, all of these, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says in verse 11, such were some of you. He's, in, he's taken all those sinful, wicked things out of you and put in the Holy Spirit of Christ in you and charged you as a joint heir. But ye are washed. This is how you were made whole again. You're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So you're washed, point A, in Christ's own blood. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the king of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I underlined it in your outline. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's, this is God incarnate in the flesh that washed our sins away. The sin that we fell in Adam, and the sins that we enact in our life all completely washed away 
with the with Christ's blood. Why he loved us. Look at that in Revelation one one five. Him that loved us. He loved us from before the foundation of the world. The Father elected us. Christ Jesus loved us. He gave his life for us, shed his blood for us, and bought us back with his blood. Turn to Ezekiel to see how rich you are now in Christ. Ezekiel chapter 16. It's the last verse we're going to turn to. Ezekiel chapter 16. Now when I pass by thee, this is God talking to you, dear sinner, elect. When I pass by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. He just saw love when he came up to you to save you. And I spread my skirt over thee, and I covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. He purchased you with his blood, dear one. If you're ever to come to know Christ savingly, this is a personal sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid down his life for you, covered you with his blood. Then washed I thee with water. That's the word. He preached the gospel to you. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, put bracelets upon thy hands, chain on thy neck, put a jewel on thy forehead, earrings on thine ears, beautiful crown upon thine head. These are all attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of these beautiful things are Christ's righteousness. All his obedience, all his character, all his conduct were decked out. The bride is decked out with Christ's goodness. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings on thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Verse 13. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver and thy raiment was of fine linen, silk, broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour, honey, and oil. Thou was exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom, right into eternity with the Lord. And thy renewed went forth among the heathen, for, for that thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. For it was perfect through my comeliness. It's the comeliness and the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ that you're made beautiful. You're decked out in all the best of everything because of Christ's comeliness which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. He dressed you. He enables you with everything. And he gives all his righteousness of his dear son to you as a, as a joint heir. Also in your outline is Revelation 7, 14. You're washed in Christ's own blood. These are they which came out of great tribulation. God's saying that you came out from being persecuted in this world. And, but you washed your robes, made white with the blood of the Lamb. So in Revelation, there's a proclamation of all those that, that washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. How can you get a, a, a robe clean with blood? It's Christ God blood. It's holiness. It's righteousness. Point B is that you are sanctified by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, God hath from the beginning chosen you. You're chosen to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification means holiness. The Holy Spirit within you sanctifies and finishes the work off. It's the Lord's work. The Holy Spirit's put in. You grasp that you're saved now. 1 Peter 1-2 says it this way. We were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto or because of the righteousness or the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the sprinkling of the blood. And the sprinkling in Greek means to be sprinkled, to sprinkle over a limited amount. This is limited in that the blood is particular for the elect. And it says it right there in 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. There's a sprinkling of the Lord Jesus Christ's blood right to the particular elect. And it completely washes you of all your sin. Point C, you're justified by his blood. Romans 5, 9 says, Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There's no more wrath. There's no more fear of death, dear one. 
It's completely paid for. The substitutionary work of Christ accomplished all that would have swamped you into hell throughout eternity. Christ's work accomplishes that. His blood and righteousness is your salvation. Acts 13, 38 and 39 says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's Christ Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things. What are those all things? Your sins. From which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. You couldn't justify yourself. The law of Moses was not a means. The law of Moses was given to show the knowledge of sin. You were used to go about trying to establish your own righteousness to keep the, the law of Moses. That's not a means. Christ's blood is the only means. And he provided the lamb slain before the foundation of the world to take your sin and to take it to the grave and to announce you're completely made clean and whole in Christ. And now you have the name, that's the character and conduct, point D, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You have the spirit of our God in you, crying, Abba, Father. He's your Christ and you're his bride. You've been made whole in him. You're totally obedient because he's charged you obedient. You're, more, you're holy and righteous because he's charged you holy and righteous, all based on the character and conduct of Christ who, who died for you. And in conclusion of this message here this morning, um, I've got it in the outline. The last page, I need to flip it over here. 1 John 2, 1, my little children, my dear children, my elect children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. Don't go about acting like you used to. Don't go about sinning. But if you do, you've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He washed all these sins away. You're completely free of it. There's a sin unto death that's called walking away. You can't even do that. You can't, you won't, if you're secure in Christ's blood. It's impossible. But there's the sin that grieves the Holy Spirit. Run from those things. Don't be a part of it. Put off those things that you used to be involved in. Be renewed. Look at the Holy Spirit. Look at all that you have. Look at all the gain that you have. And look at those around you that don't have pity on them, mercy, pray for them. They despitefully use you. Bow to God in the fact they're despitefully using you. Tell God he's sovereign over it. Thank him for it. And pray for those that despitefully use you to show the grace and the mercy that you've been given in the Lord Jesus Christ. And rest your conscience on Christ's work alone. This is my desire for each one here at Grace Bible Church. I just love you dearly, everybody.